um, to thank the candidates very much for being here today and for taking the time to share your views uh, with this group. Um, I know it's so important for uh, candidates to air their views and let the public be truly informed when they make this important decision. I want to welcome you to the campus of the University of San Francisco. The law school actually is across the street, uh, across Fulton Street, so if you haven't been there, please stop by and see us. Um, and and uh, now I want to uh, introduce a, a little bit more about these candidates to you. We have Chesa Boudin, who's a San Francisco Deputy Public Defender. Chesa has tried more than 300 felony cases and is a leading advocate for criminal justice reform. We have Leif Douch, who is a Deputy Attorney General for the State of California and past president of the San Francisco Juvenile Probation Commission. Leif has prosecuted more than 300 criminal cases in state and federal court. Leif has served as a policy advisor, drafting legislation and testifying before the California State Assembly and State Senate on a variety of issues. Susie Loftus is currently serving as legal counsel for San Francisco Sheriff Vicki Hennessy and has served San Francisco law enforcement for more than a decade as a prosecutor, police commissioner, and a community and youth advocate. Susie is also a native San Franciscan. And then we have Nancy Tung, who is currently the Deputy Distri District Attorney for Alameda County. Nancy has been a prosecutor in San Francisco and Alameda counties and for the Attorney General of California for close to 20 years. She has tried thousands of cases in federal and state court. Um, we have Marissa Lagos, who, uh, who Yolanda introduced a little bit, but um, I just want to say Marissa, as I was driving into, uh, into work this morning, I heard Marissa on the radio. <laughs> so, so this is a long day for Marissa. Um, and uh, as you know, she's a correspondent for KQED, KQED California Politics and Government's Desk and a co-host of uh, Political Breakdown, which is a podcast. And before that, she worked uh, for the San Francisco Chronicle, covering city hall and state politics. And these candidates, um, you know, what's exciting is that they are going to appear like they have never debated before. But this <laughs> is what I understand to be maybe the 11th or 12th of maybe 30 debates that they are engaged in. So um, not only I think you law students and undergrads out there, not only do I want you to get some um, inspiration uh, in the art of public speaking and public debate, but also in the art of keeping things fresh when, uh, when it's really not that fresh. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, and at the same time, I look forward to not only the speaker's comments, but also to, um, to your questions and to their answers to those. So without further ado, um, I turn it over to Marissa. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. So as someone who's been covering San Francisco politics for like 15 years, which I know is insane, look how long, young I look. Um, this is so amazing. Like give yourselves a round of applause for being here and being engaged. I think we don't always appreciate like how special of a city this is that people are so engaged in these local races. So I'm really happy to see everyone here. Um, I'm gonna go over a couple of housekeeping issues just so you guys know the sort of rules of the road. I've already been informed by one candidate that these guys are scoff laws when it comes to time limits. So um, I'm gonna put my uh, mother of a three-year-old hat on and really crack down. Um, no, but we have uh, our fabulous timekeepers in front. The way we're gonna do this, we're gonna start um, with two-minute opening statements from each candidate. They'll get a little time cue when it's time to start wrapping it down and when it's red, please stop. Um, we'll have 90 seconds to answer each question, which is kind of an eternity on a debate stage. I know some of these have been like 45 seconds. So hopefully you can actually get a full uh, answer out. And if somebody invokes you personally, attacks you, there's something you really want to respond to, you can have 30 seconds. But I would just remind you guys that there's four of you and we only have a little over an hour. Um, good job starting on time, by the way. That was pretty incredible. Um, no personal attacks, and we ask that the um, crowd just be respectful and keep the campaigning outside of the room. Um, and perhaps most importantly, you guys all have cards on your seats. At 6.15, we will collect those. Um, some folks will read through them and hand them to me. There's no guarantee I'll get to all of them, but I'm really interested to see what you guys are wanting to hear about. So um, 
again, welcome, and thank you guys for being here. All right, Nancy, you're sitting next to me, so let's start with you. Sure. Um, opening statement, please. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Ooh. Wow, that's a good microphone. <laughs> good evening, everyone. My name is Nancy Tung. I'm running for San Francisco District Attorney. Uh, I am a career prosecutor. Um, I've been a prosecutor for more than 18 years. 16 of those years in San Francisco split between the Attorney General's office and also at the San Francisco District Attorney's office where I kind of cut my teeth as a line prosecutor. Um, in that capacity, I worked through misdemeanors and felonies, including auto burglaries, residential burglaries. I did an assignment in narcotics for two years, really prosecuting cases that are coming out of the Tenderloin, the Mission, and the Bayview. Um, and then I went into domestic violence um, and prosecuted cases there, safeguarding some of the most vulnerable victims in our judicial system. And also, I took a specialty and I handled every single stalking case I came across the desk in San Francisco for about that period of time for two years. After that, I transitioned into uh, a white collar focus. Uh, so I prosecuted white collar crime and also civil law enforcement, uh, holding corporations responsible. Um, one case in particular also resulted in $25 million judgment for consumers against Uber. Um, I also uh, worked in a, in a unit that did special prosecutions, um, including uh, official misconduct and unofficial misconduct um, by police officers. And so in terms of public integrity, I prosecuted criminal cases against law enforcement and also uh, safeguarded our elections by prosecuting elections fraud. I'm running for district attorney because I saw that there are some problems in San Francisco and that they really needed to be addressed. What's happening on our streets isn't working. And I think you can see that every day when you walk down the streets. Um, we have car break-ins, we have property crimes, we also have open air narcotics dealings, and these are some of the issues that I wanna to begin to address as district attorney. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Susie Loftus, and it's good to be back at USF. I stand before you as a proud graduate of the USF Law School. I see some of my former classmates in the house. Thanks for coming out, guys. Um, I actually started in the uh, night program here at USF. Um, I returned after being an organizer. Uh, I worked as a labor organizer while I did my first semester of law school. Um, I went on to graduate in three years, and when I graduated and crossed the stage, uh, on my hip was a very cute six-month-old with red hair, who's my first daughter, Maureen. Um, and I went on to uh, become a prosecutor here in San Francisco, and I had my second daughter when I was prosecuting domestic violence, and I had my third daughter when I was prosecuting elder abuse and general felonies. But if you go over to the law school, you'll see there's a sign up about my career, and what they talk about is that I left a career in law enforcement and being a prosecutor to build a center for kids in Bayview Hunters Point. Because what I learned from my time on the back end of the system is if we truly want to build safety, we have to start much earlier and we have to take a public health approach to much of what causes a lack of safety in our neighborhoods. What we know is safety is too often predicated on zip code and the justice system too often works for those who have privilege. So my career has been about being a courtroom prosecutor, taking a public health approach to violence, and holding the police accountable as president of the San Francisco Police Commission. And I look forward to talking with you about that. But the reality is we have a tremendous opportunity here in the city of St. Francis. This is my home, it's where I'm raising my family, it's a place that I deeply love. We have to reject the idea that we can have a safe city or we can have a just city. In San Francisco, we can build a city that is safe for all of us while we reform a system that we know isn't working. We do know that we have car break-ins at the top of the rate that it's been in many, many years, but we also know hate crimes are at a 10-year high. And with the culture of hatred in Washington, San Francisco needs to be an example of progressive values in action, and I look forward to having your support as your next district attorney. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Leif Douch, and I currently serve as a Deputy Attorney General for the state of California. Uh, but in the interest of spicing things up, I'm actually going to recite Chase's opening statement, because I've heard it about 25 times this one. It's pretty good. Uh, so, uh, you know, I work at the Attorney General's office, uh, and I'm running to uh, restore some accountability to our criminal justice system, whether that's holding our city officials accountable for the homelessness and mental health crises out on our streets, whether that's holding law enforcement accountable when they engage in misconduct, 
or whether that's holding accountable the organized rings that are breaking into cars by the 50s and 100s. Um, but I'm not just uh, more recently interested in these issues. I've been passionate about criminal justice my entire life, and it started with my mom. My mom was one of those saints that makes the criminal justice system work. Uh, she was a nurse at the local juvenile hall down along the central coast of California where I grew up. And she would spend the nights working uh, with kids on their mental health issues and their physical health needs. And she'd come back home in the morning and tell my sister and I as we were getting up and getting ready to go to school about these kids. And she came home one day when I was eight years old and said, it's not enough for me just to tell you about these kids. We've got to bring them into our home. We've got to become foster parents. And we took in a dozen foster kids over the course of a decade. Uh, we adopted two kids, my younger brother Ian and my little sister Alyssa. And so from the time I was eight, I saw the impact of race, of trauma, of poverty. Uh, but I also saw amazing people like my mom and her colleagues working inside the criminal justice system to make it more fair and equitable. And that's what inspired me to go from a small organic farm uh, along the central coast of California to Yale, to Harvard Law School, to working on President Obama's campaigns in 2008 and 2012, working on voter protection, making sure everyone's voice could be heard in our political process, to serving as the president of the commission, to uh, spending the last seven years prosecuting over 400 criminal cases from trials to arguing in the California Supreme Court. Uh, I hope at the end of the night you'll see I have the passion, the experience, and the ideas to get this job done, and I would love to earn your support. All right, Chesa. Chesa, we're doing good on time so far. So, keep, so we're doing very well on time so far. So, My name is Chesa, and um, this is actually the second time that I've been in USF today. Uh, <laughs> I was really excited to be here for a couple hours earlier this, af this afternoon talking to a bunch of students in USF's criminal law clinic about money bail, an issue I've worked on for years and that I hope we get to talk about more later tonight. But let me go way back, decades before I started litigating impact suits to end money bail in San Francisco and beyond. When I was in diapers, my parents left me at the babysitter and they never came back. That day they drove the getaway car in an armed robbery that tragically left three men dead. My mother served 22 years in prison. My father is still incarcerated today and he may never get out. My earliest memories are visiting my parents in prison, going through steel gates just to give them a hug. Years of prison visits taught me how broken our criminal justice system is for victims who have so little to show for the billions of dollars that we spend on incarceration and on punishment, how broken it is for the families torn apart by crime and by punishment, and how broken it is for the taxpayers that foot the bill for the most expensive, least humane, and least effective system anybody could imagine. I started advocating for reform when I was in grade school. Through my time at Yale and at Oxford, I continued fighting for criminal justice change. And when I came back to the United States, went to law school, came to California, clerked for two federal judges, and I joined the San Francisco Public Defender's Office. That is a big difference. I'm the only candidate on stage who decided not to contribute to mass incarceration. I'm the only candidate who spent my career fighting to end money bail rather than using it to detain poor people. I've never prosecuted an immigrant and force them to face consequences a US citizen would not face. Instead, I persuaded the sheriff to stop cooperating with ICE before it was sanctuary city policy to do so. We can transform our criminal justice system. We can give victims a voice. We can end mass incarceration. We can heal the harm that crime causes every day. But to do it, we have to start by electing different people to the office of district attorney. It's my life's journey. Please join me. Thank you. Thank you, Chesa. All right, I'm gonna mix it up a little. So I wanna start kind of high level and talk about the office, and then I do wanna get into some of those specific issues around bail and car robberies and a lot of the things that we all experience here in San Francisco. Um, Leaf, for no other reason than I'm looking at you, let's start with you. Um, as was mentioned earlier, this is the first time in any of our lifetimes that there hasn't been an incumbent in this office. Can you talk specifically about what changes you would make from the current district attorney? What would you do on day one? So I think you'll hear a lot of really exciting policy initiatives and proposals uh, tonight, but none of them are possible if we don't repair the morale in the office um, and get the office functioning again. About a quarter of the attorneys have left the DA's office in just the last year alone. The, the office is losing big cases, people are getting referred to the state bar. This is an office that is in disarray. And I think it's critically important to uh, elect someone who has the management experience and the prosecutorial experience to do the job. 
I'm the only candidate on this stage who on a day-to-day -day basis is both a prosecutor and who manages a team of prosecutors as an assistant supervisor at the California Attorney General's office. Um, and so it's critically important to have that experience. Um, what are we gonna do to actually turn that office around? Right now, I talk to friends and supporters in the office who are handling 120 to 170 cases at any given time. That is outrageous. There is no way anyone can provide the individualized assessment and the individualized justice that you need in that office. So we need to get supervisors back into the courtroom handling cases. We need to look at some of these units like the crime strategies unit um, that are in a, in a perfect universe. Um, we, we could have that looking at crime trends, looking at glorified police work, but in an office that is drowning, we need to get those trial attorneys back on the trial rotations evening out the caseloads, and I'm gonna be someone who's gonna lead from the front. I'm gonna handle uh, an active caseload. I can't say I'm gonna handle 170, but I'm gonna lead by example, lead from the front, and repair the morale within the DA's office. Thanks, Leif. Chesa, I wanna to go to you next on this. Um, as you noted in your opening statement, you're coming from a really different place than everyone else on stage, and morale is an issue. Some people, I think, would attribute that in part to our current DA being an outsider. How do you sort of navigate those you know, competing priorities and, and what's your priority on day one? Well, I, I appreciate the question, Marisa. And you know, the reality is that all four of us on stage are more than capable of leading this office. And the question is where we're gonna lead it, what our vision is, and what's different than the failed status quo. I'm the only one on stage who hasn't spent my career prosecuting cases, who hasn't been in a position to directly shape the way that the district attorney's office or the attorney general's office works. The legacy we see today that is so frustrating to crime victims, to people who are called in for jury duty, to judges who uh, have their courtrooms clogged up with cases that really um, you know, are not the most serious cases. Uh, I think those folks recognize the system is broken and we need a change. Now, when it comes to what we're gonna do and how we're gonna do it, um, there's a number of things we can do on day one. We can end money bail. We can stop using racist sentencing allegations and enhancements. We can refuse to use evidence in court that's generated by illegal searches or racial profiling. We have a major problem with racism in this city, in the police department, and we need a district attorney who on day one says enough is enough. But the big picture goal that's gonna take time to achieve is transforming the district attorney's office, the culture and the reputation, into one that is a leader across the country that attracts world-class talent from all over the country to come and work in a transformative office that believes we are safer when we invest in education rather than incarceration, that believes we can give every victim a voice through restorative justice, that believes we are all, as a community, better served when we focus on the root causes of crime rather than simply punishing the symptoms. Thank you. <laughs> Nancy Tung, let's jump to you next. Um, as you said, you've been a prosecutor for many years, and, and I think you, um, in part, left the DA's office because you were unhappy with the current leadership. Can you tell us what specifically you want to see change there? Well, thank you for the question, Marisa. Um, I'm glad the question wasn't, why did you leave the DA's office? <laughs> <laughs> really. Um, so uh, I think that one of the most important parts about the next leader of the district attorney's office is that there's somebody who has been through what the prosecutors in the office are going through, and also that, that you understand what's going on and that you see what the weak points are so that you can fix it. I was a prosecutor in the San Francisco DA's office for 11 years. During that time, I went through every single rotation that you could imagine there. And also, I've understood what the, the difference is between where we are advocates and we disagree with public defender's office, where we can col collaborate together with the public defender's office, and actually where we need to push back against the def public defender's office and also with the judges. So, in, um, with the judges here, <laughs> if I'm the DA, I might push back. Um, so, I think what's really important is that if you look at what happened when Jeff Adachi died, may he rest in peace, the, district, the, the public defenders in that office said, we want one of our own to lead us. And that's because they understand what happens in the office. And I think that for somebody to take over, to come in and build the morale back up and really understand what a prosecutor's job is to take care of victims and to take care of what's happening in the system with some fairness, that you do need a prosecutor with the experience to step up and lead, and that person is me. All right, Ms. Loftus, you are last but not least on this first question. Um, tell us what we would do, you would do as someone who's been in that office and also left. 
Yeah, so I think the opportunity of change is, is massive, right? It's, it's um, you have a chance to think differently and do things differently and change is hard. And so I think it's about finding the right leader to do what's next in San Francisco. And here's what we know. We know that if the rest of the country had the rate of incarceration of San Francisco, um, we would eliminate mass incarceration in the rest of the United States. So San Francisco currently incarcerates at half the rate of California and a third of the rate of the nation. So what we have to do is look at and diagnose what we need to do differently here in San Francisco. And what we have to do is build safety and build a different way. And so what we're looking for in the next district attorney is someone who can build that different way. Someone who can work and recognize, you know, they just released new crime statistics today about crime victims by ethnicity. And what we see is, I looked at 2009 to 2018. In 2009, homicide rates by ethnicity were 80% people of color. And in 2018, it was 76% people of color. So what we need to do is elect a district attorney and run an office that is as committed to survivors and victims and communities impacted by crime, and someone who has the ability to cycle people out of a broken system that we know doesn't work. I, I dated myself when I jumped into this race, and I said, you need a DA who can be Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire all at the same time. You've got to be able to dance forward and backward, deal with the worst of human behavior, and cycle people out of a broken system. But what we need, and what I think this office is looking for, is a leader who is grounded in the experience of people impacted by crime and violence, and someone who is committed to building a better way, and that person is me. Thanks, Susie. I want to get at something that I think sort of is part of the tension of being district attorney, which is how do you grade success? I think for a long time that has been around um, either conviction rates or um, how many people end up in prison, and, I, and, and, and it seems like you guys all want a different way. So um, Nancy, why don't we start with you? What, what does success look like? Are we talking about trial victories or are we talking about something broader? So when I was in the district attorney's office, we never kept book on what your trial stats were. Nobody ever said to you, a supervisor would say to you, oh, well, you know, you have a, an 80% uh, guilty verdict rate, and so, um, you know, you need to get your stats up. That was never, never the, the issue in the DA's office. What we were empowered to do as prosecutors was to step in the courtroom and do justice. And so when we, when we think about what does justice look like, it means that not only are we taking care of victims of crime, do we have um, higher reporting rates among the lowest reporting groups, so, so Asians are the lowest reporting ethnic group in terms of crime reports. Um, African Americans are the most likely to be victims of crime. So are we reaching into our communities to build better relationships with our communities of color, with our, our communities, our neighborhoods, so that we have better response rates, so that we have better trust? That looks like success to me. And then what are we doing on the back end uh, in terms of fairness and justice? I want to say that in 2010, when I was a narcotics prosecutor in San Francisco, I was the only person to stand up and say, I am not going to prosecute drug-tainted cases because a criminalist in the San Francisco crime lab was, was basically juking the results in all of the tests. And so out of those 800 cases, I was the only person to stand up and say, I'm not going to prosecute those. That looks like success to me when we have prosecutors that are empowered to do what is right in our justice system and what is right for everybody. Thank you. Chesa, how about you? You've been on the other side of the courtroom on a lot of these. I think there are four critical metrics that we need to start using and focusing on to measure the success of the district attorney's office. First healing the harm that crime causes to victims and to communities. And we can measure that in a number of ways, particularly victim engagement. I'm going to require the district attorneys and the uh, uh, victim services unit to contact crime victims within 48 hours of filing every new case. We need to keep victims in the loop, we need to inform them, and we need to make sure that their voice is heard as part of this process. Second, I want to make sure that we are measuring our success in addition by reducing recidivism rates. Victim engagement, reducing recidivism rates. Not just conviction rates, not just length of sentence, but are we intervening in people's lives in a way that causes them to be less likely rather than more likely to commit crimes? We know today that two-thirds of people 
coming home from prison, will end up incarcerated again within a few short years. The system is not working, and we need to start holding ourselves accountable to metrics that actually relate to public safety. Third, the speed of trial. We have cases, serious cases, rape, murder, attempted murder, that are five, sometimes 10 years old at the Hall of Justice. We need to do a better job getting those cases resolved and resolved quickly. Victims deserve it, the public deserves it, the witnesses who are called in to testify about events that they can barely remember deserve it, and fourth, racial disparities. Uh, I've heard one of the candidates on stage say mass incarceration is over. Let me tell you, in the African American community in San Francisco, that is not true. We incarcerate more African Americans per capita than any other city in this country, and a rate three times the rate that Russia incarcerated its citizens during the peak of the gulag. Mass thank, incarceration is not you, over. Chesa. We can end it. Yeah, like I just respond? want to respond. 30 seconds. All right, 30 seconds. So incarceration rate is actually a number. So it's 266 people are incarcerated per 100,000. So if you measure San Francisco versus the, the national rate, which is 655, uh, our rate is significantly lower. So I do think facts matter and we should be oriented as to what our incarceration rates, re, incarceration rates are. And I've listed having a civil rights unit to deal with the racial disparities because racial disparities are something that we need to tackle and the next district attorney want, does. But what we first need to do is start from the same playbook and an incarceration rate is a number. Thank you. All right, Chase, I quickly. Just very briefly, I totally agree facts matter, and I think it's really important we be transparent in what facts we use and not pretend that the African-American community in San Francisco is treated equally or equitably. The incarceration rate for African-Americans in San Francisco is above 1,700 per 100,000. So 266 is the rate you just heard for San Francisco as a whole. For African-Americans, it's above 1,700, the highest rate in the country. Thank you. Leaf. Jump in here. How would you measure success as DA? So we put out a proposal uh, in a Chronicle op-ed about a year ago saying we need to move away from just sheer reliance on conviction rate to also assessing prosecutors based on the recidivism rate of the defendants that they are prosecuting. So just to put some numbers on it, if you have someone who overcharges all their cases, forces plea bargains and wins 99% of their cases, wins 99% of their cases, but 70% of those uh, defendants reoffend within three years, that is a failed prosecutor in my book. That is not someone I will hire, that is not someone I will promote, and not someone I will you know, put on high for the office to see. A better prosecutor might be someone who actually charges cases equitably. Maybe they only win 70% of their cases because they're taking more cases to trial but they're investing in the underlying root causes and maybe only 25 or 30% of those prosecutors reoffend within three years. Those are the sort of prosecutors that I wanna uphold. And we know there's a model that works. I've seen it firsthand. It's the juvenile justice system here in San Francisco. I was the president uh, of the commission that oversaw Juvenile Hall, and over the course of 10 years, San Francisco has gone from a 150 kids at the hall on a given uh, night down to about 32. That's the reason we can have this conversation now about shutting down Juvenile Hall and using it for a better purpose. I would love to turn it into a mental health justice center to uh, address the serious mental health issues on our streets. But the only reason we can have that conversation is because we gave prosecutors the right incentives and we drilled down on root causes. We know it works with young people. Let's expand it to the entire adult system. Thank you. Susie, what does success look like if you're a DA? So the first policy proposal that I put out was uh, starting a first in the nation and certainly first in this office, civil rights unit within the district attorney's office. Never been done before. Because one of the things that we know is not progressive about our current system is while we have a population of African Americans who are between three and 5% of our population, they are between 38 and 53% of who's in our jail. So I have stood before rooms of prosecutors, some of whom are in this room tonight, and I said to them, I know you did not become a prosecutor to exacerbate racial disparities. But if that's happening on your watch, it's your charge to fix it. You are the one person in court whose job it is to do justice. So what success looks like to me is I announced that we will partner with someone who I've worked with for the last five years, and that's Jennifer Heberhart at Stanford University, to look at and do an unflinching audit of all the practices of the district attorney's office to identify where bias exists and eradicate it. Because what we know is bias exists on who gets called nine, who calls 911, right? It starts there. Bias grows at arrest rates. It grows at who gets charged. It grows at who stays in custody. It grows at what the sentence is. 
and it grows in length of supervision in probation and parole. So what we know is there's a lot of steps in there that your next prosecutor, understanding deeply this process, can unwind after doing an unflinching look. We need to get buy-in from everyone in this system that bias is a poison that is an existential threat to our justice system. We will not have a safe city until we have a just city, and we will not do that until we eradicate racial bias. Thanks, Susie. All right, well, we, we could stay at 30,000 feet all night, but I wanna, I wanna get into some of these issues. So quality of life, I think, broadly, is something that every San Franciscan, regardless of their political stripe, has concerns about right now. Um, I think we should, let's start with drug crimes. Um, Nancy, let's start with you. I know that we have heard um, about a recent crackdown in the Tenderloin by federal prosecutors. Um, and, you know, Given where we are at in this country with the opioid epidemic and a lot of times the blurring between who's an addict and who is, a, uh, who is selling drugs, I'm curious just how philosophically you want to approach this issue as DA. Um, and, you know, should, should San Francisco be in the business of locking up people for drug crimes or is there another way? So I think that as prosecutors, if we stop and say we're not going to hold people accountable for crime, that we are failing in our jobs as prosecutors. So the way that I look at the, the drug crisis in San Francisco, we definitely have people who are, who are users, who this is a public health issue, and we should treat it as a public health issue. We definitely have people who are in selling, and that is because they're addicted to drugs, and also that becomes a public health issue. Where we really need to have the enforcement is when we have organized crime that is coming into the city to prey upon the most vulnerable people, people who are addicted to drugs, people who are on our streets every single day, shooting up heroin in front of kids, in front of people walking, just trying to get to, get to work. And when we, when we don't hold responsible those people at the top, then we have the situation where the US Attorney's Office has now stepped in and it's taken away local control over these criminal justice issues. It has also caused a disruption in the Tenderloin because what's happened is that now the drug dealers are fighting over turf and the San Francisco Police Department has not been involved in that issue from the ground up because the US Attorney's Office has taken over. So what we really need to do is work with other agencies in order to make a better plan and also attack those problems. Because what you don't necessarily hear about is that in the Tenderloin, it has the highest concentration of children in the entire city, second highest concentration of elders in the entire city. And we have completely failed this community, and we need to do better. Thank you, Nancy. Susie, let's go down the line. How, what do you want to do about drug crimes? Would you prosecute them? And, and how is this, you know, because I think people have a lot of conflicting feelings about this in San Francisco, to say the least. <laughs> So, um, you know, I think that what I want to say is when I thought about running for DA, there's a few people that I went and talked to, and a group of them were some um, senior citizens who live in SROs in the Tenderloin. And they were very kind and had a listening session with me. And this one man I'll never forget, and, and I think we have to humanize this so that we all understand what the issue is. He's in recovery, he's in his 70s, on a fixed income, and he said, you know, Susie, I don't have a problem saying that I don't want the drugs from the drug dealer who lives at the front of my building. I, I'll tell him no, I'm clean, right? He's got clean, he's proud of his sobriety. He said, but what I have a problem with is when they push me because I'm not going to buy drugs. And, and because I'm, you know, he's in his 70s, he's afraid of falling, right? So I think people have conflicting views about this because we're in this sort of zero-sum game that someone wins and someone loses. Like, we've gotta take the side of one person over the other. And I think on this issue, what we've gotta really deal with, and I agree with Nancy, is we've gotta disaggregate what's happening and figure out what we're gonna do about addiction. Look, we funded a war on drugs. It was a colossal failure. Have we funded a war on addiction? Have we? No, of course not. So what we do is we go back to what we know. And everybody in the city is rushing to every one of us, saying what we know is that when, we do, when addicts are on the street shooting up, you're the guys, the cops come. They arrest them, they throw them in jail. So this goes back to fundamentally what San Francisco has to do is build a better way, build a different approach. And that is a partnership with the Pub Department of Public Health. All That's right. where my background comes in public health. We have to Thanks, handle Susie. this as a public health issue with public safety consequences. Thank you. All right, Leif. 
So this is not an abstract question uh, or issue for me. I work in the Tenderloin. The Attorney General's office, uh, where me and some of my colleagues uh, in the audience here tonight work, is at the corner of Larkin and Golden Gate. So if it's going from my 49 bus to the office or walking down Golden Gate uh, to Morty's Deli to get a sandwich, um, I see the uh, opioid crisis, I see the drug crisis every single day. I've walked past two dead bodies in the last six months. 10 people died of fentanyl overdoses in the Tenderloin in the first two weeks of June alone. So the opioid crisis is not just a national issue, it is a San Francisco issue, and we need a comprehensive drug reform approach. It's not enough just to talk about the problem. What are the specific solutions that we're gonna take? I have a lot of compassion and empathy for people battling addiction on the street, and we need things like counseling, intervention, safe injection sites. I'm a strong supporter of those. I toured the one they set up at Glide Cathedral last year. There's never been a fatal drug overdose inside a safe injection site anywhere in the world. But you know who I don't have much compassion or empathy for is the folks that Nancy identified earlier. Out of town, organized crime drug dealers selling fentanyl, drugs that are killing people, heroin, meth, drugs that destroy individuals, drugs that destroy communities. We can do those two things at the same time, it's nuanced, but San Francisco has been a leader in innovation and smart on crime approaches for so long. Let's do it with the opioid crisis and the drug crisis in the Tenderloin. Thank you, Leif. My cousin spent two years on the streets battling addiction. It was devastating for her, for her mother, my aunt, for our whole family. You know what didn't work for her in those two weeks? The war on drugs. We all know that the war on drugs in this country was a colossal failure, and I refuse to double down on that war on drugs. Now, we need to do something, to be sure, about the open air drug use and drug sales in the Tenderloin and in other parts of this city. We need a much more effective approach. We need one rooted in treatment and in harm reduction. We need one that recognizes the root causes. And we need to find a way to stop children who are walking to school from having to step over hypodermic needles. We can do it through safe injection sites. We can do it through partnerships with community-based groups. And we can do it by having a harm reduction approach. Now, I've worked in San Francisco's collaborative courts, our drug court, that works with people arrested because of their addiction. And I had a client who told me, it is easier to get high than it is to get help in this city. Until we change that, until we make it easier, until we have 24-7 access to drug addiction treatment, we are going to continue dealing with these problems, no matter how many people we arrest. Now, about a third, this is, this is an important issue that no one's talked about, about a third of the people arrested in San Francisco for drug-related crimes are undocumented young men from Honduras. We need to understand what is driving their participation in the drug sales market, and we need a specialized, tailored approach to prevent them from continuing to selling drugs. Criminal prosecution is not working. I'm the only candidate who's committed to starting an immigration unit to address these problems. Thank you, Chesa. I think we've touched on mental health, but I know several of you have pretty fleshed out plans. Um, in terms of how you want to handle that. Um, and I would like to sort of couch the question, uh, you know, you all have your own ideas, but in how involved the DA can and should be in issues of homelessness and mental health? Um, it is a powerful office, but it is one of many city offices. Um, and Leaf, let's start with you. I'm the only candidate throughout this race who has been laser focused on homelessness. I think it, the DA has a critical role to play, uh, and it's the reason I've been championing the idea of turning Juvenile Hall into a mental health justice center. Again, this is informed from my experience working in the Tenderloin, seeing the not just drug abuse, but the mental health crisis every single day, um, and talking to folks like the firefighters, who I'm proud to have their, their endorsement, uh, and realizing that 75% of their calls are not for fires, Therefore, well-being checks all too often for people on the streets. I've talked to docs at, at, at General Hospital ER and psychiatric nurses, and they say, we don't even bother seeking things like conservatorship orders uh, or orders for people to get the mental health treatment they need because we don't have the beds. So we've got to address that underlying capacity issue, build out our mental health system. You know, we saw the attack down along the Embarcadero, uh, and it's one thing for us to say people battling mental illness don't belong in our courts and in our county jails. I agree but they don't belong right back out on the streets. They belong in a robust mental health system. But all too often, we blame Ronald Reagan for shutting down the state mental hospitals 40 years. Don't get me wrong, I love to blame Reagan with the rest of them. But Democrats have controlled San Francisco for the last 40 years. 
We've controlled the state for the last 15 years. What have we done to step up and fill that void? Let's turn Juvenile Hall into a mental health justice center and to start to build that community-based network of care that was supposed to be the second step and never happened. I'm committed to getting it done. Thanks, Leith. Nancy, I wanna to go to you on this. Um, you kind of alluded to this earlier. I think you have a slightly different tact on this. And you know, Leith brought up that attack um, that has been in the news quite a bit lately. I, I know that the ADA in that case actually argued that the suspect should stay behind bars because he was previously in drug treatment and it didn't work then and why would it work now? Um, is that the entry point for the DA's office, you know, to be involved in this conversation, or is there something broader you can do as district attorney? So, so I think that the, the city overall is trying to figure out what to do with the problems around mental health issues, around drug addiction issues, around homelessness, because homelessness kind of is this overarching category that we try to explain why a person doesn't, isn't permanently housed, but actually there are some different root causes to it. I think where the district attorney's office gets involved is actually where a person enters into the criminal justice system. And at that point, we can actually use it as a point of intervention. So, you know, under this, the, one of my platforms is about community-centered justice, and it's about being a, a part of the, inner, the neighborhoods, it's being into the community, and like, trying to figure out how we deal with the issues that are affecting communities um, by being a part of it, instead of waiting for something to happen, being more proactive and less reactive to things. But at the same time, like with this watermark case it, that happened down at South Beach, how many of you saw the video of that woman being assaulted? It was a pretty serious assault. And so the idea that if this person is having a mental health crisis, um, a drug, uh, drug-induced psychosis or some combination of the both, that it is a point for intervention, but we also need to make sure that the person is going to return to court, that the, the person is not a threat to public safety, and so I think what we need to do is actually work on those collaborative court ideas about how do we have treatment within our system, how do we exit people out of the system in a better position than when they came in, and how do we protect public safety at the same time that we're addressing a person's root criminal causes. Thank you. Susie? Same question. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I think at the, at the core, how, how does the DA interact with mental health and homelessness and what should be the role of the office? Yeah, the first thing is, I agree with Nancy, we have to disaggregate what's happening. And oftentimes, you know, when I knock on doors, uh, some of yours I might have knocked on, um, when I knock on doors and say, hey, what do you care about at the DA's race or public safety, homelessness is almost number one, the thing that people talk about. But I think what that means is we're, we're talking about street behavior, we're talking about people suffering some, from severe mental illness on our streets, they may or may not be housed. So I think it's important to be responsible in the way that we talk about this. Um, it's obviously a crisis, it's a humanitarian crisis in our city, and, and I, I'm excited that the voters are demanding that every leader talk about how they're gonna approach this. And the DA specifically has two roles. One is, we know that 70% of the people who end up homeless on our streets were housed at one point in San Francisco. So that's one of the pieces of my civil rights unit is looking at unlawful and unjust evictions. And it's also a civil rights component. If people are being targeted to, for evictions based on a protected class, formerly incarcerated, person of color, that's something that the district attorney should protect against. There are certainly powerful interests. Our city is changing. You need a district attorney who's gonna stand up and protect the housing that we have. But on the back end, people are leaving our jail every day Day. There's not a plan for their housing. I mean, it's just we look the other way, people get discharged, and then we clutch our pearls. Oh my goodness, what are people doing out on the street? We actually know, and we know when they're going to go out on the street. And I think we, as a district attorney, need to re-envision what our job is, which is I don't want people to come back to me. So when they leave us, I want there to be a solid plan for them to be housed, for them to get the treatment that they need, for them to be able to serve their sentence, and those are pieces that the district attorney can definitely, absolutely impact. Thank you, Susie. Chesa? So I think data is really important. So I want to start with a couple statistics that should inform our approach to this critical issue, right? 75% of the people booked into San Francisco County Jail are drug addicted, mentally ill, or both. 65% of the people who go to jail will be there for a week or less before leaving. And about 40% of the jail is unhoused or marginally housed prior to their arrest and have nowhere to go upon their release. We are missing a critical opportunity as a city to use the district attorney's office and to use people who are arrested and cycling through the jail, about 17,000 individuals a year, 
to have a point of intervention, to triage, to find ways to turn every arrest into an opportunity for intervention in transforming lives away from crime, regardless of whether or not a criminal case is actually filed. We cannot continue to have the jail serve as a dumping ground for a public health crisis. And we cannot continue to have the jail serve as a revolving door for people living in crisis. Right now, we know empirically that people who are low risk who are arrested and put in jail for even just a couple days are dramatically more likely to commit a crime when they're released than people who are not housed in jail. It is criminogenic, it is making us less safe, and we need to do a better job recognizing and partnering with public health officials. I am so proud to have the endorsement of the National Union of, of Healthcare Workers who are on the front lines of this work, doing the care work for people in mental health crisis. We need to expand their work and their role helping to treat this mental health crisis before crimes are committed, not just waiting until after. Thanks, Chesa. I want to stick with you for a second, Chase. We got, we got a question from the audience about plea deals, and I think it's a really important question that we don't always talk about in these types of forums. Um, we know that in most counties, that is how cases are adjudicated, through plea deals. I'm sure you've been on that side of the table as the public defender, and you guys have been on the other as prosecutors. The question from the audience is, poor people are disproportionately incentivized to accept plea deals even when they're innocent, how do you balance efficiency and justice? And I would sort of broaden that out to just say, what, how would you approach plea deals? And is that part of you know, the, the points we talked about when we talked about success earlier? Because I can tell you as a reporter, it's really hard to cover these races and, and look at an incumbent and judge their record because you don't know what that data actually tells you when you talk about, say, conviction rates. So I think there's a couple of things that are critical if we want to end coercive <laughs> plea bargaining. The first one is we need to end the practice of systematically overcharging, especially young black and brown men, as a way to have leverage in negotiations. The second thing we need to do, go ahead, clap, go ahead. It's his time. The second thing we need to do is we need to end money bail. Because when two people who are charged with an identical crime have drastically different situations. One of them held in custody simply because of their poverty, while another one who may be higher risk is able to buy their freedom. All of us are less safe as a result. And the person who's in custody is likely to plead guilty simply to get out, regardless of whether or not they're guilty. That undermines the integrity of the entire criminal justice system. We need to make sure that people who are dangerous and cannot be safely released are not released regardless of wealth. And we need to make sure that people who are not dangerous and who can safely be released with appropriate conditions are safely released as quickly as possible. Now, the reality is in San Francisco and across the country, about 98 plus percent of cases that are filed do not go to trial. They resolve for some kind of a plea, occasionally for a dismissal. That's okay as long as we're not coercing those plea deals, as long as we're making fair offers, and as long as we're giving victims a voice in what the process looks like. That's why I am committed to giving every victim of every crime the opportunity to participate in a restorative justice process. If we do that, we have a dramatically expanded horizon of solutions to heal the harm that crime causes and reduce recidivism rates. Thank All right. You. Chase is jumping ahead. I want to talk about bail and restorative justice, but let's talk so good plea deals, Leaf. So I know there's a number of attorneys here in the audience, so let's remember that uh, trials are a feature, not a bug, of the legal system. We shouldn't be terrified of trials. That was this, the model uh, that adjudication was supposed to follow for these sorts of cases. But there's such a lack of transparency and data available, we don't really know what's happening in the DA's office. So they haven't issued an annual report since 2016. Until a couple weeks ago, there was really nothing up on the dashboard or on the website at all about what was happening to cases. So let me just use one example. A couple years ago, my wife and I had our car broken into, and I said, this is outrageous. I'm going to find out everything there is to know about car break-ins. I went to the DA's website, no annual report. We asked them for, uh, for disposition data on what was happening to the uh, cases. Nothing. We finally were able to go to the Superior Court and they said, oh yeah, we've already prepared a report on this, here you go. In 2017, there were 31,000 reported car break-ins. Any police officer you talk to says it's at least two or three times that, but let's start with 31,000 reported car break-ins, 500 arrests. In the 500 cases where they caught someone and sent those cases to the DA's office, they took one case to trial in the entire year, and they lost it. 
So clearly there's a lack of a deterrent message being sent, but if we don't have the data and we don't know what's happening within the DA's office, we don't know what's happening with those cases. We've got to get the data out. That's why I'm committed to radical transparency. I'm gonna put millions of data points up on our website, every stage of the criminal process, along with the race, gender, and age of every criminal defendant so we know where that racism we talked about earlier is rearing its ugly head. Thank you, Leif. Susie. How do you approach plea deals, and is there an argument for less of them? Yeah, so the Supreme Court, um, in sort of the seminal case that defined a prosecutor, talked about the, I think they call it a pe peculiar, peculiar role of a prosecutor, uh, and really one in, in service of justice, to make sure that the guilty don't go free, nor do the innocent suffer. So baked into the fabric of what it means to be a prosecutor is sort of this duality. And that duality is actually the power of this job, is that you don't get to, do, you don't get to choose who you care about. When you stand up and you say, Susie Loftus for the people, you actually include, you, the defendant is one of the people. So are all of you, so are the witnesses, so are the survivors. And so I think part of what we've got to get back to is in a time of massive change and correction and things that we have to do better, we've got to remind people of the nobility of this profession, what you are called to do. Our, the, the innovation of the public prosecutor didn't exist 150 years ago. You had to have enough money to bring an action if you were harmed. So the public prosecutor stands for this idea that a crime against one of us is a crime against all of us. And so how we deal with plea, plea deals and plea bargains is we train up and remind prosecutors of the nobility of their job. We have them shoot straight. We don't have them overcharge. We don't have them play any games because this job is such a high calling. The stakes are so high when you can take someone's liberty that what we need to do is build a crop and support the lawyers who are there in doing justice every single day and doing some funniness around plea bargains or playing games is not part of the district attorney that I will run, district attorney's office that I will run. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Susie. So any of you that have spent time in the Hall of Justice or have been an attorney either on the prosecution side or the defense side know that plea bargains are actually a really important part of what we do. Um, it helps make sure that our judicial system runs efficiently uh, because unless you want a much bigger government, a whole lot more judges, a whole lot more prosecutors, and a whole lot more defense attorneys, we don't have the resources to try every single case. And so the idea that we have is, is to try to make some things more efficient, but also to try to keep them fair. And I'll say that from a practical standpoint, I think there's a lot that we can do in the DA's office to better remove biases from our plea bargains. And that includes making sure that we have bias training for the people who are charging cases because there's just a handful of them. And let's make sure that we have uh, race neutral and socioeconomic neutral kind of factors that we, we use in charging. And then when we talk about the people who are making plea deals, right now, all of the attorneys are making plea deals, but why don't we make more efficiencies and have just a few people who go through explicit bias training, implicit bias training, and, and have those people who are managers, who know the cases and who know what they're worth, make those plea deals instead. The other thing I wanna talk about is that San Francisco is actually a model for a lot of the collaborative courts we have and exiting people out of the system early. So before we even get to the step of plea deals, let's talk about collaborative courts, let's talk about diversion, let's talk about neighborhood courts so that we get people out of the system without a conviction and get them on their way. Thanks, Nancy. Okay, it's the moment Chase has been waiting for now. Uh, bail, let's talk bail. Can I... Um, <laughs> Can I just have you guys raise your hand if you supported SB 10, the bill that passed last year? Okay, awesome. Well, then let's start with you two. Um, can, can I ask broadly, I believe, um, I know the answer, Chase's answer, but does everybody support bail reform? Do you guys all think that there need to be changes in the system? Okay. Um, I have a feeling I know what Chase is gonna say because this whole boss wrote an op-ed about it. Um, so one of the big challenges that really California and, and the rest of the nation is facing as, as we talk more about bail reform is what to replace it with. So that's what I wanna drill in on now. Um, the PSA tool that is used here in San Francisco was developed by a foundation. Um, there are other uh, pre-trial assessment tools that are in use. There have been questions raised about whether they have implicit bias uh, baked into them. Um, the concerns I think that Chase will 
talk about with SB 10, which was the bail reform that passed last year and was signed by Jerry Brown, um, there's a concern that judges might have too much control. So I want to kind of pose the question to all of you of what you think the best system is to replace bail with um, and, and really just how the state should move forward. Um, Susie, you want to start? Yeah, so money bail doesn't make us more safe. I, I tell this story just to, to give it life. When I was a prosecutor, I came back from second maternity leave, uh, had my second daughter, and uh, opened up the file that I'm arraigning, and it was someone who'd shot up my corner store. And as all San Franciscans, we know the sacred spot that is our corner store. So um, so I arraigned it. I looked at the facts. It got one of my neighbors. He was at the local bar. Somebody pushed him. He took umbrage. He... Um, went, uh, got in his white Volvo. I don't know why I remember that it's a white Volvo because this was a case from 10 years ago, but he got, went home, went to his gun locker, got out a semi-automatic weapon, got back in his white Volvo, drove. Uh, the gentleman was no longer at the bar, so he was, he thought the man who'd pushed him was in my corner store. So he lit it up, shot into it as he was driving by. So luckily, by the grace of God, no one was killed. Um, but with that particular gentleman, I argued for, you know, um, a significant bail. I felt like um, that that was a significant public safety risk, he put up his house and walked out that day. So the idea that bail was the system that we had, the idea that it made us more safe, it's fundamentally flawed. And so what I think we need to replace it with is based on risk. And what that means is we have to have a system that, uh, a risk assessment tool, which is, um, I think we're going to have to make it here in San Francisco, one that recognizes that if we're just putting data inputs that uh, are part of a system that has been very biased, that's a threat. But we really do have to decide who's released based on who is a public safety threat, who is likely not to return to court, and not how much money is in their bank account. We need to pick a DA who can build this system collaboratively with all the stakeholders because the stakes are very high. And I think people Thank will look to San Francisco for a model. Thank you. Chesa. So I was on the committee that the ACLU convened to help draft the original version of SB 10. I supported it in that form. I was sorry to see it amended drastically at the last minute in a way that was really untransparent. And I wrote an op-ed on the cover of the Daily Journal explaining why I opposed it in its final form. Um, you know, it's amazing to see everybody on stage today say they support bail reform because during their careers as prosecutors, every single one of them used money bail to unconstitutionally detain poor people. And one of the interesting things about the story that Susie just chose to tell was her frustration with someone who was able to get out because of their wealth. What the other side of that coin looks like is all of the countless mostly black and brown people who were not able to get out, charged with crimes like marijuana possession, charged with crimes like illegal camping, who because of their poverty in San Francisco, and across this state are stuck in jail until they waive their constitutional rights and plead guilty. It does make us less safe. It does discriminate. It does undermine the integrity of the criminal justice system. And that's why I'm proud to say that for the last four years, I have led litigation efforts in San Francisco and beyond to end this horrific practice. I have a case pending right now before the California Supreme Court, and just last week, a federal court in a lawsuit that I initiated four years ago issued an injunction that will force San Francisco to use a risk-based system rather than a wealth-based system. That's what justice looks like, and that's what leadership on this issue looks like. Leif, Leif I want to go to you next. Um, assuming you support the, the, these systems, do you have any concerns about their efficacy when we talk about risk assessments? Sure. So someone's freedom should not depend on their wealth. That just has to be the starting point uh, for all of this. Um, I work at the Attorney General's office. We were on the receiving end of some of those lawsuits that uh, Chesa filed. And we ultimately decided after uh, you know extensive review and thinking about what our constitutional role is uh, in, in California to fall on our sword and not defend the money bail system. Speaking personally for myself, you know, it's an immoral, uh, illegal system. There wasn't a legal defense or moral defense that we could mount against it. And so it's important as a prosecutor to know which cases to zealously defend and then also to know when to bow down and recognize you don't have the law or justice on your side. And that was an instance where the same reason that I supported Senate Bill 10. Um, does it get everywhere to where we want to go eventually? No. 
but having worked on the legislative team for two cycles up in Sacramento for the Attorney General's office, I know the power of getting something enshrined in law that is a seismic shift, maybe not as far as you want to go, but then you go back the next term, and the next term, and the next term, and you continue to refine it and tweak it. We're not going to be able to solve bail reform in one year, or two years, or maybe even four years. It's going to take a DA who's committed to this job, who's not using it as a stepping stone, who wants to be here for a long time doing this work. I'm a young guy. I got a lot of energy. There's no term limits on DA. So if I'm lucky <laughs> enough to win this thing, you're going to be stuck with me for a long time. But we are going to get the job done and solve this the right way. It may be incremental. It may take some time. But we're going to do it right. Uh, and, and it will probably be... Uh, tweaking this uh, uh, um, uh, assessment, this algorithm tool, to make sure we are making those release decisions based on public safety risk and flight risk, not right. based on wealth. Thank you, Leif. Let me just note, Leif is expecting his first child, so he doesn't even know what nope. Tyra looks like yet. Mm -mm. Um, Talk to me after December 30th. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Nancy, um, you're the only one who didn't raise your hand about SB 10. I assume there's some nuance there you want to get into. Sure. But talk about... Your experience, and I mean, we've seen this again just recently with that watermark case really yeah. become an issue. Well, uh, I was actually going to talk about that. So um, the idea that you can buy your freedom if you have enough money, I think is one that is not grounded in fairness. So we should really be looking at a model where we a ju judge or a person's risk to public safety as the reason for which they are detained in our system. And so... My, my issue with some of the algorithms is that they also have some bias within them. And then the judges who are making the decisions also have bias, implicit bias within themselves too, no matter how fair and just they wanna be. So I've always, I've advocated for a limited role of money bail and just having a sliding scale based on ability to pay. So if a judge makes a decision that a person supposed to, is gonna be detained based on whatever bias is not expressed, that the person still has an opportunity to try to bail out based on their ability to pay. Whether or not you agree with that is a completely different issue, but where we have seen a breakdown in that is that in the Watermark case, the public safety assessment said, you should detain this person. And the, D the DA in that courtroom said, you should detain this person. And the public defender in that courtroom said, uh, you could release him with some conditions. And the judge released him, even though the PSA said to detain. And it was only after a public outcry that the judge pulled the case back and said, oh, I wanna put some more conditions on this case. So I think it's really important that we start to analyze where public safety really is the goal. And if we're gonna use these public safety assessments, <laughs> that we use it in a fair way that's gonna actually protect the public. All right. I could keep talking about bail for a while. I know somebody else on stage could too, but we only have about 10 minutes left. And I do want to talk about something I think is really important in this moment, which is how you as district attorney would approach officer-involved shootings and use of force cases. Um, Nancy, let's stick with you for a second, because I know you have called for an overhaul to that investigation process, I believe it's part of your campaign. Um, so talk about what that looks like and what, what needs to be changed from how things are being done now. So I've actually been in a unit in the district attorney's office that investigates criminal misconduct of police officers on every level. I've also been involved in the officer-involved shooting uh, review team. And so what's really important to me is that as a prosecutor, as somebody who holds a public trust, that you, that you have transparency within those issues, that it's open an open and fair process to both sides, that we achieve closure for the families of the person who died and also for the officers that are involved in a balance. So my, my viewpoint on this is, and I've said this since I launched my campaign in January of this year, that we need to have a review process that's completed within six months. If it's not completed in six months, then one month updates every, day, every month after that until the case is closed. So that the public is aware of what's going on, so that the people who have a stake in the outcome are aware of what's going on. And that's, so the DA's office is accountable to the people in the community about officer-involved shootings and the results of those shootings. I think it's critically important that we uphold fairness and that we are transparent in our process to make those decisions. Thank you. Short, look at that, thank you. No. <laughs> um, Chesa, let's jump over to you. 
You know, this is such a critical issue, and there are some people who are going to tell you that San Francisco is a model that, you know, we've solved the problem. And I think anybody who says that is really out of touch with the communities that I serve every day, with the communities that are impacted by over-policing and by police brutality. You know, the families of Luis Gangora, of Mario Woods, of Alex Nieto, of Amalcar Perez Lopez, of so many others who have been gunned down as unarmed civilians by the police never received justice. They didn't receive justice from the police commission, they didn't receive justice from the police chief, from the mayor, and they didn't receive justice from the district attorney's office. That has to change. We need a district attorney who enforces the law equally, who holds police to a high standard, and sheriff's deputies. We have a scandal ongoing in the county jail where deputy sheriffs have been assaulting inmates with impunity and where in a fight club case, the sheriff's department was unable to protect the integrity of evidence used in an ongoing criminal case the district attorney's office actually filed. Now my track record is standing up to police brutality and excessive force. I've cross-examined officers in court on a daily basis. I've um, exposed the abuses at the jail. And it's for those reasons that the Deputy Sheriff's Association is attacking me using something my parents did when I was in diapers. Here's my commitment as district attorney. Personally, make charging decisions in every officer-involved shooting case within six months and announce the decisions publicly. Second, refuse to use evidence gathered by or testimony from officers with a track record of dishonesty, police brutality, or racial profiling, and not outsource these critical investigative tools to other agencies. We'll handle them in-house. All right, thank you, Chesa. <laughs> Susie, how would you, I, I know you worked on this issue at the police commission, how would you change how San Francisco currently handles officer-involved shootings? Yeah, we have to fundamentally change it. Um, I wanna start on my record here. Um, the San Francisco Examiner uh, called me the face of police reform in San Francisco because we did three important things. One is I terminated more officers for serious misconduct than had ever been done in the history of the San Francisco Police Commission. I demonstrated holding officers to a higher standard when they violated the public trust. Two, we armed and equipped all SF patrol officers with body-worn cameras. At the end of the day, it's a search for the truth, and that aids us every day in knowing what's going on in these interactions. And third, and finally, we reformed the use of force policy for the first time in over 20 years. And many people here, members of the Bar Association, I see Julie Tron, I see so many leaders here that my leadership style was saying, how can we fix this together? And what we did do was we said, we're no longer going to use the legal standard of reasonable force. We're going to create a community standard of force that needs to be necessary. And that has become a model in Sacramento. Shirley Weber took it, AB 392. No, we're not perfect. We're never gonna be perfect. But San Francisco has become a place where when the worst things happen and the trust that the community has in the people sworn to protect them is broken, we built an approach and a response that three years later has seen a reduction in use of force by 30% by San Francisco police officers and a reduction in injuries to officers. But what we have to do differently when I'm DA, Cops can't investigate themselves on officer-involved shootings. Come on, you guys. My 10-year-old knows that. We've got, to bring in, we've got to bring in the California Department of Justice to handle the investigations, and we need to be much more transparent about the results. If a crime happened, I'll charge it. Thanks, Susie. Leif, last but not least. I believe that even one officer-involved shooting is too many. Now, one of the first groups that I met with uh, after I filed last year to run for DA um, was a group of community activists who uh, had lost family members to police violence. And after speaking with them, there were kind of three themes that kept coming up. Um, one was the, the fact that these cases were taking years to resolve, and it really felt like the DA's office was just trying to run out the clock and wait till the outrage died down. Um, two, there was basically no transparency or explanation for why these officers were not being charged. Um, and three, it was like a murder or nothing, all or nothing proposition. There was no real uh, engagement or consideration of alternative charges. Uh, so my platform has been laser focused on those three concerns coming from the community and coming from the people most impacted by this. I vowed to make a charging decision within six months in every single case, hold a town hall, to explain to the public why I am charging or am not charging uh, an officer and to answer every single question. I don't know that we're gonna do that tonight with the uh, index cards, but I will answer every single question the community has about those, question, those, uh, those cases. And then we've got to consider every available charge. And I think this is why it's so important to have a district attorney who is a prosecutor, who is a trained lawyer, and who understands lesser included offenses. 
maybe it wasn't murder. Maybe the officer didn't wake up that morning saying, I'm going to go out and shoot someone. But what about negligent discharge of a firearm? What about assault with a deadly weapon? Uh, what about attempted murder? What are those lesser charges that can give some semblance of justice to the families and are winnable? Thank you. All right, I want to say thank you to all, can all the candidates for being so well behaved and really sticking to the time limits tonight. Um, we are going to have a minute each for closing remarks. So I'm going to start with Chesa and go down the line. And then afterward, there is a reception. So stick around and uh, tell us what you thought. Thank you all so much for your attention tonight. Thank you all for your interest in this critical topic. San Francisco and this country are in a really unique moment. It's the first time in any of our lifetimes when there is a broad national consensus that we need a new, different, better approach to criminal justice. I'm running for district attorney because we need to seize this moment. Reform does not look like partnering with the disgraced, fired chief sir to achieve police reform. Reform does not look like doubling down on the war on drugs. Reform does not look like electing people who think the status quo is acceptable. Reform looks like leadership on ending money bail, leadership on ending racial disparities, leadership on restorative justice and giving victims a voice in every case, leadership on ensuring that we can build a safer, more just community that reflects all of our values with a district attorney's office that has language access for all and that reduces crime, not just punishes it. Please join me in realizing that radical vision. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Marisa, for moderating, and to all of the organizers, and to all of you for uh, taking such an interest in this race. It's the first open seat race in 110 years. Let's not settle for the status quo. Let's chart a fundamentally new direction for this city and for the DA's office. And I think it's really important to be specific here. I think we've all identified the problems. Well, what are the specific plans we have to fix them? We're gonna start a mental health justice center by turning Juvenile Hall, that 150 bed empty facility, into a 150 bed full facility so people on the streets battling serious mental illness can get the help they need. We're gonna start an auto burglary task force so instead of one prosecutor who is amazing but is one person charging every car break in in the whole city, she has four people working with her and partnering with the law enforcement uh, leaders you need there. We're gonna start an online rape kit tracking pr uh, uh, portal so that survivors of sexual assault know what's happening with their rape kit. We're gonna start an environmental justice unit. These are the things that can, are, get, are gonna get us out of the hole we're in right now. Please go to our website, check out our specific proposals, and I would love to have your support on November 5th. Thank you. Too often you're asked to choose a team. Are you on team safety? Do you not want your car getting broken into? Do you want domestic violence abusers held accountable? But you know what, if you, if you care about that, you can't really focus on racial disparities in the criminal justice system, that's just too hard. Team safety. Over here, team justice. I wanna eradicate racial disparities in the criminal justice system. I wanna undo wrongful convictions. But I literally had a guy tell me at a farmer's market yesterday that I think it just means my car has to get broken into in San Francisco. My campaign is about building a better way. Let's reject the idea that we can have safety or we can have justice, we can have both. That's why I do have everyone, I'll tell you guys, I'm guilty of having everybody from Dianne Feinstein to John Avalos. I have Shimon Walton's sole endorsement. I have the sole endorsement of the Democratic Party. I've got the sole endorsement of the black firefighters. I've got the sole endorsement of the firefighters. I've got the janitors. I have built a coalition that stands for the idea that we can do something better, that San Francisco should lead the way on building safety and justice. Don't choose, you can have both. So San Francisco is one of the most progressive district attorney's offices in the country. And I'm proud that I started out my career as a trial prosecutor in the San Francisco DA's office. We send the second least amount of people to state prison out of the 58 counties in California. We spend the third least amount on imprisonment in county jails. We are doing a good job, and yes, we need to do better, but what's really facing San Francisco now is what's happening on our streets. We are number one in the nation of crimes per capita. We are number one in the state of police reports filed per capita. We are having a crisis in terms of law enforcement, and we need to do better. 
We need to do better by building bridges with law enforcement agencies and working together to break the gangs that are coming into San Francisco to commit crime. We need to do better by going into our communities and building bridges with neighborhood groups and making sure that it's not a one-size-fits-all type of justice for everyone. And we need to do better by building up the office again because we have reached a critical point in San Francisco's DA's office where 30% of the attorneys have left. I'm the person with the experience and the independence to do that. I hope I will have your support with early voting of October 7th. <laughs> <laughs> now it's just and, a PSA. And on November 5th. Thank you very much. No. Okay, well thank you so much candidates. Thank you Marisa, you did a lovely job. Didn't they do a fabulous job? Okay, okay, audience members, you have a couple of tasks ahead of you. First of all, you need to vote. Second of all, you need to continue the conversation about these important topics. There's so many uh, things that have come up. Uh, third of all, if you are an undergrad, you need to go to law school. Uh, and I, I have one to recommend. It's right across the street. Uh, and lastly, we do have re a reception out here. And so I invite you to stay uh, and talk with each other and with our candidates. Thank you again. And thank you to our sponsors. <laughs> <laughs>